Hey, I'm Mill Hurley, and today I'm at a very special place, Fresh Cut Flower Farm, with the owner, Sarah Pappas. She's been running this flower farm here in Detroit and doing an amazing job. I can't wait to hear her story. Rudy, come here. Come here, good boy. Uh, this is Rudy. He's our sweet little farm dog, and um, we found him in Solstice, running around the city a bunch of years ago. He, he's your baby. He's our baby, and he's our hunter. much to learn today, and so do you. So come on, let's get in the gardens. Sarah, mm -hmm. when did this love of gardening start for you? For me, the love of gardening came out of learning that gardening was the way to build self-sufficiency. Um, it came when I was working in New York at the Nutrition Education Program and we were talking a lot about access to healthy food and how some neighborhoods have been deprived of that access through racist geographic real estate practices and that learning to grow your own food and engaging with the natural environment in your own relationship rather than being mediated by an outside force is a beautiful and powerful grounding force for justice and happiness. And that, that's really what motivated me to improve my farming skills. We're out here on, uh, what is this, where the are we? Rosa, Rosa Parks oh, yeah. and Forest, uh -huh. right? Okay. And this, is this like one of your newer fields or have you had this field now for a couple of years? This field, the Southwest field, we've had it for a while actually. Um, we've been tilling leaves in every year, you know, trying to improve the soil and it's definitely a lot better than it has been in previous years. Well, you have got a lot of plants in here, Sarah. What? Yeah. Tell us what's in each row, starting at the street. Sure, so in the first bed, there's um, a few different kinds of solosia. Uh. There's the sifid, and then there's a few of the coxcomb varieties. There's a Sunday series. So they all come in different shapes. Um, they do different things, but super long lasting, dries really beautifully. Um, next is there's gumfrina, which is those little balls, yep. dries really well. Uh, dianthus, that's actually the second planting of dianthus. Dianthus is one that always confuses me because, right, botanically it's a biennial, but you can get first year flowering varieties. So that's what I have the most experience with the Amazon series. So this is the Amazon series. And it, we have an earlier planting of the Amazon series behind us, uh -huh. which is on its second flush now. And they're actually both doing really well. We're gonna leave one of the patches in the ground over the winter to see what it does the second year because you know the model of the really old-fashioned dianthus right is you have one and a half years of vegetative growth before the flowering season and i feel like i can't afford that kind of real estate right but those varieties are beautiful yeah. so i'm definitely i've used a lot of amazon dianthus but i'm really eager to learn more other types of varieties mm -hmm. we've got straw flowers in the back which again is one I have some learning goals around because we have beautiful vegetative growth, but the blooms are still um, not as prolific as I'd like them to be. So I don't know if you have any hints. No, I was just going to ask you, could it be because of our season in Michigan? Yeah. If sometimes we just don't have a long enough season for a plant to really develop into the, the yeah. flower that it's supposed to be that we see in the picture. That might be it. Well, when you moved here mm -hmm. and you moved into this house in this area, you had this idea germinating about your own space to do what you wanted to. How did you come to that though? Mm -hmm. Had you had experience before you came to Detroit mm -hmm. working with 
agriculture? Yeah, so before I came to Detroit, I had a couple different types of farming experiences. I started out doing nutrition education and a tiny bit of gardening in New York City with teenagers. And that was my exposure to the food justice movement and it made me want to learn more about farming. So from there, I took a certificate in agroecology and sustainable food systems at the University of California at Santa Cruz. So I got to live on this beautiful farm, the oldest organic farming training program in the country at 40 plus years. And you get to live in a tent side of the strawberry fields overlooking the bay. So it's really the place where you fall in love with farming and how beautiful it can actually be to collectively work together on land. From there, I did two seasons at a 10 acre CSA farm in Poughkeepsie, New York, and I got a lot of tractor experience. I got experience with 400 member CSA. Um, and along the way, we were focused on vegetables, but I always was working with flowers on the side. So, um, when I saw this land, and once I had gotten to know the agricultural setting of Detroit, I saw what kind of farms were here, I saw what kind of markets were here, I made the decision that a specialty cut flower farm was the right fit for me, for this land, for this city, at that exact time. So then we've got a little too much status. It's a lot. We don't need this much <laughs> But that's the part of <laughs> that's what happens. That's up, right. Yeah. That's right. We've got beautiful beds of eucalyptus. I was telling you earlier, though, it does not grow fast enough in our climate to get to the seeded portion, which is so popular with the brides. But that's fine. So we've got our dahlia patch next to it, and then of and course then the classic got, sunflower. Well, we've got zinnias before that. Oh. And um, the cactus variety is one of my favorites. It's really um, eager to bloom over and over. The blooms are a nice size and it comes in a nice kind of muted mix of colors. We've also got whirligig and peppermint, which are two of my favorite little novelty varieties. And then we got the next bed, a bunch of kinds of sunflowers and a little bit of marigolds at the end. That big sunflower there uh -huh. is a double delight, which is like my new favorite double variety. Cause you know, the teddy bears, they're cute, but they only get this big. Right. Double delight has that full shaggy head and you know, really tall, good secondary blooms. Great drama. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, for the bouquets. Yeah. And behind us, we have an assortment. One of the things I think is interesting is your cabbages that you grow to put in a bouquet. Yes. I love, I mean, flower and cabbages are beautiful. Because a cabbage can be huge and that would overtake a bouquet. So right. what do you have to do to keep it kind of tall and skinny? So you strip, you know, well you plant it a little closer together than you would like a broccoli or a cabbage plant that you were trying to size up to eat. You could string and stake them the way you would dahlias or tomatoes uh -huh. to keep them upright. And then you strip the leaves off um, as it grows upwards and keep it growing up. Because it's more about the top of the cabbage that's what you'll in eventually cut and use in the right. bouquet. Right, yeah. great big Yeah, cabbage. we strip off those lower leaves. Yeah, it's not like what you buy in the grocery store. No, no, no. Not what you eat. And we are in the Woodbridge community, right. aren't we? So mm -hmm. we're close by Wayne State, the lodge is on the east side. That's it's, right, yeah, yeah, we're just a couple miles north of downtown. Yeah, and right in the city of Detroit and a typical scenario that we have seen, and a lot of us know, with an empty lot by a house. Mm -hmm. Was that part of the the focus for you and your partner oh, that yeah. you wanted to find a house that had an empty lot? Yeah, we lived in Woodbridge since we moved here. And so I walked by this house all the time, seeing this house with a fence and these vacant lots aside from it. Um, and we were able to buy it from the previous owner with a conventional mortgage, which, which can sometimes be difficult to get here because the banks don't always see the value the same way everybody else sees the value of what's going on. What happened the first year when you, you had your business going? The first year, let's see, we kept it inside of the fence. We had put in our application to buy more land, but the initial year we were just growing inside the fence. Um, we had a friend, a fellow gardener in the city who he trains horses for plowing and he actually brought his horse out 
um, to do the very first plow. There was a lot of buried debris, unfortunately. Um, you know, this each each house lot here came down at a different time, and so you really see the effects of laws on what you're allowed to do when a house comes down. In some places, everything's just pushed in on itself. Um, in some places, it's filled with pure sand, which, you know, is like oh, a gardener's dream yeah. to a certain extent. So um, it really is important what happens when houses come down, and we've seen a lot of those effects. And were you at the very beginning already thinking of CSA type of uh, business? And Rudy just is so happy yeah, to be a part Rudy's of Yeah, Rudy's a sweet boy. You know, puppy dog Rudy. Were, were you thinking of the CSA model? And tell us what CSA means. Right, so CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And I'd been exposed to that model through a lot of the vegetable farms I was part of. And the reason that it works for a lot of farmers is because the customers pay into um, the farm at the beginning of the season. So the farmer has starting capital to work with for the season. And then each week, the customers receive a share of the bounty of the harvest of the farm. And it's a really important model worldwide for farmers to be able to afford to run small, diverse operations. So I did a little bit of a twist on that because um, in a true CSA model, if your crop fails, that's just the cost of doing business and the customers have bought into that risk with you. Now here, because I was growing flowers, which are wonderful and add value to your life, but they're not a necessity in the same way that food is, I didn't feel as though I should take all that risk. I said, okay, well, if it fails, then I'm gonna just use your money and buy from other local growers to still provide you with the floral product that you wanted. Um, but this, that didn't end up happening, you know, we use foraging and we do buy a little bit to supplement from other local growers and to get to know, to have an excuse to get to know other local farms. But having that weekly CSA model, I call it the weekly bouquet service, having that weekly bouquet service gave me the reason to start a weekly harvest schedule, to practice my um, harvest and post-harvest handling every week and to get better and better at making bouquets each week. What have you got to start? I pulled this one stem of wild aster. It's nice to start with something branchy. So. And, and do you ha grow that here or is that I mean, we forest? grow it yeah. at the edges or when I run out of it here, get it from the parking lot. Yeah. So then I like to take something big. This is one of those cabbages that we nice. saw. A so this is sunflower. a ruby eclipse sunflower. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a great variety. We've had a lot of them this year. Japanese anemones, mm -hmm. you know, that little delicate purple, mm -hmm. perennial. Yeah. I'm gonna start in with the amaranth. And it has such a nice softness to it, the way it kind of droops. Mm -hmm. And that's a part of the um, design of a bouquet, isn't it, Sarah? Right, yeah, definitely. Um, and then we've got some yarrow here. We were talking about like springtime things that come back around in the fall. We've got some scabiosa. Love it, that's another perennial. Right, we've got these double lemon kind of um, sunflowers. Well, that scabiosa looks lonely, so I think we should add a few more. This is one of my bouquet rules that I think is breaking conventional rules is I think things look really great in pairs. Sarah, these can be Sarah's rules. Everybody That's has right. their rules and these are Sarah's rules. Sarah's rules for order and disorder yeah. in a bouquet. One of my customers calls it her hardest and best choice each week is which bouquet to pick. Oh, Sarah, yeah. how wonderful. Yeah, you are a woman, a pioneer here in Detroit, I think. I like to call you and think of you as a pioneer, a flower pioneer. Well, because you have taken a dream and an idea and you've made it into reality. Some parts I'm sure have been easy and some parts are a challenge. When did you come to Detroit and how did you come up with this idea of having a flower farm? Um, came to Detroit in 2011 to work for some of the urban ag nonprofits here and I had the opportunity to really be invited into the urban agriculture community here which is gorgeous and diverse 
And the reason I cringe at the word pioneer is because the urban agriculture community has been going strong here for a very long time. And the implication that I'm doing something new is tough. But I am doing something old in slightly new ways uh, here. So I've been farming for over 10 years in all different types of settings. And when I came out here, I was um, running a bigger greenhouse space uh, that was growing transplants to distribute to gardeners through the Garden Resource Program. In? In Detroit. In Detroit. In the okay. city of Detroit. Okay. Yeah, right. so that's a program that's got 1,000 gardens as members um, in Detroit, Holland Park, and Hamtramck. It's the biggest network of community gardeners, and it's just, it's my actual family here. Um, and kind of falling in love with the urban ag community here led me and my partner to feel like we were ready to start our own farm here to settle down. hoop house Sarah and you here it is we're in fall now mm -hmm. and you've got lots of flowers who are what is this band right here so we're in the amaranth patch we really love amaranth we've got about eight different varieties this year probably um, so we've got velvet curtains autumn's palette hot biscuits um, who's the big tall guy right there in the middle you know <laughs> you know, I put you on the spot. I know. I think that's probably an Autumn's palette, but I'm not exactly sure. They were all up there earlier, really, really? and we cut them all down a little while ago. They've got a lot of secondary and tertiary shoots that come off that are a little more right-sized for most of the bouquet work that we do. And now this is a plant, a good example of having a hoop house helps extend your season mm -hmm. because it keeps things warm in here. If I was growing this in the backyard, I wouldn't necessarily have this kind of growth for the fall because right. it, we're getting too cool in, right. our, in our nights more than our days. Isn't that right with, for the amaranth? Yeah, the amaranth is pretty hardy, but I think you would be getting a little more bent from the wind mm -hmm. if it was out there. And right, the, the secondary growth wouldn't be as vigorous mm -hmm. as this is. And because it lasts so long, this lets me know that for a few of my later events, I'm still going to have these beauties to add that texture in. And every year probably you're looking at your crop and going, oh, this was a bestseller. I'll definitely grow this again next year and I might change up what you grow. So that's always a part, the evolution of, of the growing for you is right. always what's the most popular and, and also I bet what you'd like to try that might right. introduce a plant. Because amaranth, I remember this from long ago, and it was like, eh, who likes that? But like a lot of things, it's right. come back in favor. Yeah, because it's go a long cycle. And it's a long growing, or a, a long, you can keep it in the bouquet for a long right. time, can't you? Yeah, we really focus on long lasting varieties so that people can expect their bouquets to live seven to 10 days easy. Nice, well, what fun to see the amaranth in the hoop house. I feel so lucky to be in the Detroit urban agriculture community, partly because of the black leadership. I've really been welcomed in and gotten to learn a lot about visionary black leaders in the city and the kind of collectivism and imagination that's encouraged is it's gorgeous. And the people who I can find to work on the farm come out of some of our many urban agriculture training programs. So there's the Detroit Black Community Food Security Farm Training Program. There's Earthworks Urban Farm Training Program. There's the Urban Farmer Training Program through Keep Growing Detroit. And I've hired graduates of all of those programs. You know, the conventional bouquet wisdom is what, like, thriller, filler, and spiller. 
and I guess we adhere to that to a certain extent. We sometimes tend to break the bouquet rules a little because we make so many. the most enjoyable or satisfying part of this enterprise that you have? The most enjoyable part is really making bouquets. I love it and I love that each week what I make bouquets out of is completely different depending on what's blooming that week and I feel very satisfied to know that I can make a beautiful bouquet no matter what time of the season it is. I had a great time at Fresh Cut Flowers here in Detroit. Sarah's such an amazing person and a great gardener. And I thank her so much for opening her farm to us. Well, that does it for this episode. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you in the gardens. Ooh.